Can tech save politics? Apple's got a few new tricks up its sleeve. And drones, quick, look up in the sky. I'm Gene DeRose. And I'm Steve Rosenbaum, and this is Future Forward. Let's launch. And launch we shall. So it's fall. It's, uh, there, there's, there's a lot going on in tech and politics. We kind of mixed it up this week. We got a little tech. We got a little politics. We're going to dive into some things. But first of all, let's just jump right into loving and hating. Are, are, sure. Are, 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 we, are we feeling more loving this week or more hating this week? Uh, you know, I'm feeling a little bit more love, maybe more love than usual, although I don't know if it's more love than hating. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of a simplistic one this week, and we're not on the agenda with anything having to do with the uh, Saudi Arabia tragic journalist um, getting killed issue, but it did inspire me on a few things. And uh, what I'm loving this week, I'm going to isolate it by saying the New York Times and more broadly, it's print journalism. Um, and, I'll, and I'll launch into my hate as well so I can talk about them in context. Uh, and what I'm hating is cable, and I would say video news, uh, and CNN is, is my target because I would expect better um, from those that I would hope to be the good guys. But, but here's the thing. I feel like we're in an era where news has become kind of a, a squishy word that isn't understood. You know, it's one thing, you know, and, and what I love about print journalists and the legacy of them, even if they're now in digital form, those that write and do original reporting, is you have news and you have reporting and you have at least the attempt to focus on a diversity of facts. And, you know, we have short attention spans but it's something to be treasured in this day and age. And even if you could argue with what goes on on the op-ed pages of some of these places, um, at least those are lines that are clear one way or the other. I'm not saying everything in the world isn't inflected somehow, but I feel like cable news has become, and this is an old story, but in this today, it hurts especially bad. You know, if all we have is fixation on tiny little pieces of, of, of news and major parts of opinion swinging one way or the other. We're just not getting anywhere. It's just, it's shouting matches beyond belief. And, and what would we expect from our news feeds to be any different or the way we act as humans? You, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to flog an old idea here a little bit, but, you know, I've spent the better part of a chunk of my career uh, building a practice around this word curation. And, and here's what I would say back to you. You know, it used to be that news was limited by the size of the box it fit in. And, and that box wasn't invented by journalists. It was invented by people that made pulp, that made newspapers, how much, how big a newspaper could be. You know, the, the news hole, as it's called in the industry, was, yeah. the, was the place where the ads weren't where they put in the news. And that box yeah. had a shape. C cable broke that and the web broke it even more so now we've got and in a newspaper i mean imagine you know the way i always tell the story is imagine if you went to your local restaurant and it was your favorite restaurant and you said you know i want my favorite dish and the waiter said you know gene we're we're doing th something a little different today instead of serving you the thing you ordered we're actually going to serve you everything on the menu and you can just sort out what you want to eat and your plate, your table would be full of some stuff you like. It's, it would it would go from being delicious to disgusting. Same yep, restaurant, right. same that's menu, right. overwhelming. So so I think it's our job as technologists and 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 journalists, which we both are in different ways, to think through how to build new shaped boxes that consumers want to like reshape yeah. the size of the menu. Uh, and, that, uh, and uh, yep, I agree one hundred percent. And the boxes can be about time how much time do you have to tell it can be about form and format it's a video is a text and it can be about space real estate you literally are talking about the box of the tv and it's visual even separate from it being video versus what the legacies above the fold in the newspaper the cover of the magazine um whatever your leads are and it's true you can't begrudge the fact that there's a sort of a simplicity and a reductiveness on television and video that must be sort of confronted. I don't have answers in this particular sense. It's just that as we tack ever more towards shorter attention spans and visual cues, um, 
we there there's a there's a cost to it and um you know it's it's uh it's a very tough plight we're in right now well let, let's do this let's jump into the agenda for the show we're going to get to tech and politics a little bit later but That's but right. i want to start i wanted to start with something a little bit frothy uh just because i thought it would be fun um, yep. So let's start with this Apple announcement that's coming up. So first of all, big headline, they're coming to Brooklyn. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> Love that Apple's going to do an event in Brooklyn. I think yeah. that's totally yeah. cool. And so, historically, it's always been California. It's always been tightly controlled to the, you know, the tech fan boys predominantly. And so like just at a demographic and geographic marker, You've got to say they're trying to go for a little more of a of a broad, diverse millennial uh, East Coast kind of thing. So October 30th, they're not saying much about what the announcement is, but we all, you know, all of us Apple geeks have determined it's obviously iPads are the new iPads are coming out. Um, right. um, and then there's a whole bunch of questions about what it might be. Any any sense like anything that you think is desperately in need of refreshing? Well, I'll I'll go off the cue that they gave, which is um, we'll 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 be showing you some of these pictures, but um, uh, maybe be fitting going to New York versus uh, in San Francisco. Uh, there's a kind of a corporate and a brand um, reintroduction feel here. You know, Apple's been very careful and precious about any movement around its logo, its visual iconography and everything and and these are some kind of wild and zany visuals that are accompanying this and i and i think they're really trying to just uh you know tack around a little and shake up the brand and so i think some of it's going to be a little bit about about messaging um yeah I and agree. i think apple is confirmed something they've always uh, had a chat when Steve Jobs came back a second time as a CEO. The first thing he did was he killed off all but like three product lines. He and they love simplicity. But in a world of like IoT and multiple devices and everything's got to talk to, I think Apple struggles with this. And so they're really trying to feel their way around how they approach this stuff. Um, and their ability and desire to control things makes it really tough. It's why they've never been very good at social media. By the way, you know, the iPad, this could be, let, let's let's write the headline for October uh, 31st, Halloween, the, the day after the, the Apple announcement. I, I'm going to, you know, there was an announcement the other day, didn't get a lot of press, that Adobe is now releasing an, a, an, a, a, an app specifically for the iPad, for mobile, for phones, and also that, that uh, Photoshop is now going to be iPad capable. Um, you know, the iPad has has lurched its way into being a, a computer. You know, I mean, I think Jobs rolls over in his graves a little, grave a little bit because he really wanted it to be a consumption device. That was really, um, but 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 you can see in the meetings you and I both go to the shift from, you know, everyone bringing a laptop, everyone having that laptop flipped open to increasingly people working on iPads. Yeah, and the limitations of it from a desktop point of view have been conspicuous. You know, the idea that, like, I have always had to kind of, ah, do I carry my laptop with me too? Because there's certain things, even though there's a browser putatively, that you just can't quite do. And that's changing. Just think about the marker of how iCloud used to be all this other stuff. And now when you go uh, trying to access some things, it's called files. You know, they're really kind of, you're right, they're backing into it. You know? do, you, do you own a pencil? Oh man, I love my pencils. Can't oh. do my New York Times crossword without it. You have a pencil. You're the only person I. You are the only person I know that has a pencil. Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, look, there's another side to it that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought up the sort of uh, iPad versus computer because I think increasingly, uh, you know, the iPad and the extra large screens of our iPhones that are approaching the size of what an iPad mini used to be are our televisions. And yep. you know, for all the years that Steve Jobs um, said he's going to conquer and beat television, it's happening in the same way, I think, that um, cable never ended up winning the battle for the future of television. It ends up being delivered over the internet. Well, you know, these devices are finally bypassing the absurd bottlenecks that happen at our set top. And, you know, for, for kids and for me, I carry my television around with me. You know, do, I, I, do, do you do you use an app called Rio by any chance? No, but I'm, I'm aware of it. Yeah, yeah. So I know the CEO of Rio a little bit and I've been watching it and it really has become 
my my browser for video. I mean, they're you know, it's it's happening in the app world, and I, I I'm a I'm a fan. So so let's let's jump to this little headline, and then we'll move on to other things. So so um, so Tim Cook um, took on Bloomberg. Um, in a way that, you know, I mean, Apple tends to be pretty low key about press and it keeps things close to the chest, but it rarely fights back. And so this decision for them to go after Bloomberg to retract its Chinese spy chip story came as something of a surprise. Um, yeah, I, I don't get the sense Bloomberg's retracting anything. Yeah, well, and, and it's just to understand the bigger picture, um, you know, the idea that um, China even has the ability or any hackers to successfully get inside kind of the, the, the hardware, uh, uh, it brings everyone into it. And at the center of it, you know, you had a whole bunch of telecom guys who have a stake in this defending Apple and saying this was outrageous and it's impossible to get a foothold where really, really dangerous things can happen. Um, and the backdrop also is Apple's historic relationship with China, you know, and their desire to um, not try to dust things up too much or make it look, you know, too badly. We talked about this last week. Um, you know, look, we've talked about this before. Apple's tight control of PR, you know, are we in the era where um, even if um, these things are true, does, Steve, do, does Tim Cook and Apple just decide, you know, we need to deny, deny, deny and filibuster because it's not going to look good for, for this thing to be thought of as being true because people get afraid. You really don't have the ability to know. And there are a host of articles around this that have been investigating it over the last week. All right. I don't know. So so let's let's jump to tra- chapter two, because I want to make sure we have time for tech and politics. Let, yes. Let's let's jump jump to, to drones. So, you know, we did a little bit on drones last week in our Halloween edition. But but the Skydio uh, flying drone that's controlled by the Apple Watch just caught my eye. Um, you know, can I ask you a question? Why are drones so damn sexy? Like, well, I think that that they represent, um, you know, exploding computing, and in particular, um, kind of media-related computing. And by that, I mean, you know, video taking and photos and, and tracking GPS. You know, out of um, out of confinement to place and attach to your body. And it reminds me of. Um, how uh, we used to call early smartphones smartphones or computer phones. You know, these are not going to be called drones for very much longer. That's just a camera that's out there. That's just a new delivery mechanism. It's just a new way to, to track or uh, track people. And I, and I think it's a place where the technology is real. AI and other kinds of things are so esoteric and hard to understand. But when you see a ten thousand dollar drone or this one which is sticker price two thousand doing like incredible things there's a vividness to it that that captures our imagination legitimately so so what do you make of the the columbia journalism review wrote this piece about drones and journalism which i thought was you know pretty pretty like i mean i don't know about you but like it still seems like for most of the journalists that i know that use drones it's kind of like a it's like a trick like, yeah. hey, we went to the storm zone and we put up a drone, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a new I mean, I think it's going to be interesting, um, you know, who, uh, you know, in the journalistic um, food chain of, 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 of um, how the sausage gets made, really, when you've got writers, editors, photographers, videographers, um, uh, people in the in the in the in the media truck, uh, who is, 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 is handling the drone? You know, is it going to go along with me when I'm out doing my reporting? Will the New York Times or CBS maintain a fleet of drones for all situations that need to be addressed? You know, I think there's an incredible power in what drones, uh, video and photo capturing drones can, can, cha- can do to change things. But we're intersecting with the Wild West of what's appropriate. Is all the airspace above my house mine and private? No. Nope. You know, that and would they be a fly four feet above my head, you know. By, by the way, that would be a no. It's not private, um, and they probably can lower the drone down by the side of your window and look in your bedroom, and you know you might want to have curtains because I think that, that we're hitting a uh, as regards journalism. Uh, drones are, are, are kind of both a wonderful and necessary part of, of the ability to, uh, to to slice through things and. 
as frightening and a potential like tactile invasion of our of our privacy and propriety as we've seen. You know, this is going to be insane over the next few years. What happens with drones? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so, so what do you make? Last drone question: What do you make of this drone startup Airware uh, shutting down after burning through 118 million bucks? I mean, like, you know, if I gave you 118 million bucks, could you spend it? I think when you, uh, it's not my neck of the woods, but I know enough to to know that when you're talking about things like hardware development and the need to test things and and what you own and what you lease and all this other stuff that. They probably could spend it pretty fast. And this is an area where the opportunity is so obvious and so gigantic that tons of dollars not calibrated quite right are going to be wasted and lost in, in the interest of going after the, the billion dollar opportunities. And so, um, you know, it's a uh, it reminds me a little bit of um, because it's so physical. It's like some old world uh, uh, kinds of um, uh, uh, industries where there's a physical plant backbone to this that will be interesting to see whether these are third parties that are doing this, kind of like in the internet, how carriage and hosting and um, and ISP businesses, you know, kind of became decoupled from the, you know, the front ends and the media players and everything else. You know, it'll be interesting to see uh, if this is a uh, Northrop Drummond kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, airplane uh, and military uh, backbone or, or is this get all the way down to consumer levels and we'll be buying these things from Mattel in five years. So, so two things, though, about Airware that we got to just say out loud. One, deep, deep, deep pocketed investors. Right. So, you know, you know, these are this was not, you know, a bunch of dentists and doctors throwing in. You know, this is this is Andreessen Horowitz, Google, Kleiner Perkins. So when th they're not out of money, they made a business decision. And the winner in the drone space right now is DJI. DJI yep. makes incredibly sexy, fabulous drones, totally owned by China. Yep. Yep. Well, it's going to be an issue because the production of these things at scale is is is, is not unimportant. And I think that there is going to be. See, this is a classic space where the military, industrial, uh, 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 commercial um, uh, uses of these things will lead. And the dollars behind that are so immense where you're looking at something that that costs two thousand uh, dollars, the one that's controlled by the wristwatch, you know, I mean, the Apple watch, um, you know. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see who is able to leap into the consumer market once you get down to those 200 and below uh, price yeah. points. And, and by the way, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'd never heard of Airware before it went yeah. out of business. No, I mean, no. I mean, DJI has a great big store in Times Square that I go and occasionally pet the drones and think about wanting to take one home like a little like a, you know, <laughs> just just to have a toy to play with. Um, yeah. And just like last point on that is. Like I said originally, it's it's drones moving into such commonplace that it's the equivalent of us talking about you know eighteen wheel trucks next to like you know Hondas and Teslas you know in our home. These are all like one massive class of things that are going to have lots of different you know uses. All right, so so chapter three, let's get to um, to tech and politics because you know there, there th this began with an article um, that came out about you know what what. Um, what was called in, in Bloomberg as a failed Silicon Valley attempt to reinvent politics. I, I'm, I thought that was maybe uh, not an entirely fair headline, um, but, but this is this, is this uh, Valley bunch of money called Win the Future, WTF. Um, you know, the, the article essentially said, you know, a bunch of smart Valley guys wanted to have an impact on politics, scooped up a bunch of money amongst them, and tried to build some tech and the old school, you know, kind of political operative said, yeah, you know, you, you can stay in San Francisco. We're just not interested in 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 your uh, in your ideas. It, it was, Did you want to just do a snapshot of what that was? Because there's so many different spots in this thing. You know, they were they were. This was this was the one that was trying to help influence um, registration. Am I voter registration? You know, it, so it was Mar it's it's still it's Mark Pincus. Yep. Uh, and and Mark Pincus is you know the reason you know his name is because he did Zynga. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, I didn't know his name was so. I didn't know the name was so dramatic. So Zynga, you may remember, did Farmville and all those Facebook, you know, games that kind of nibbled at the side of your brain all the time, and and um, and he made a caboodle of money, a lot of money, and then got out of Facebook, and so you know here he is with a bunch of cash, and he's like, I want to do politics, and so when the you know you know it's interesting. Bloomberg says when the future had an unfortunate acronym WTF. I didn't think it was unfortunate at all. I thought it was. Right. I thought it was clearly, you know, um, but they tried to gamify political action, right. and and they right. they did an initially a thing with Samantha B um, that kind of didn't make a lot of noise, and um, and there is this battle in particular in inside the Democratic Party between new ideas and old ideas. And right. essentially what the old guy said is, you know, we're just stick, we're going to stick with direct mail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? Well, and, 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 and right. What he was trying to do is was create something um, that's a little more um, involved and digital, you know, but still is about a kind of activism and a kind of participation that might invite millennials and others to get involved. And I think the problem with some of this, when you've got on the one hand, um, the direction of, of, of laws that suppress voters by, um, uh, you know, uh, tearing down Supreme court verdicts on, on whether states should be monitored or access to, um, to, to polls or voter registration, you know, you've got that kind of stuff, on the one hand, and then the Facebook news stuff and all the fake news uh, on the other, you know, where, where should you be? Where should you be playing? You know, and, and I think that um, I think this is kind of a directional mistake to sort of stake a claim in that area. You and I are old enough to remember that there was initially um, back in dot com one MTV and the digital world kind of got together around Rock the Vote, yep. which was a kind of really yep. exciting and interesting thing. And I think sometimes we skip through the blocking and tackling that's necessary. You know, getting people registered and giving them the access to vote is is really an essential thing that still has huge problems, which probably could lead us to the um, the Uber story in a way. Well, but let's stay on, on WTF for a second. So, yeah. so there's one version of this that says... This is just the old guard stepping down and the new guard stepping up. And we're going to see, you know, on November 6th, we're going to see what the millennial turnout looks like. And that's, you know, in many ways, I think that's going to be uh, important and potentially sobering. Because yeah, and I'm not optimistic, by the way. About the millennial turnout. Well, it's just, you know what, I'm sorry. It'll be more than it has been in, in, uh, uh, in the past in some ways, maybe with the exception of Obama 2008. And, you know, but it's less than what it could be and should be. And I've got college aged daughters and they've gone through such hoops to make sure they're registered and they're voting. But their friends aren't. I mean, it's just incredible. They say they say they're going to they engage. And at the last minute, oh, I'm out of state. I never did my early ballot. I'm you know, it's really hard. Yep. Yep. Um, so so I, I, I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you know, thumbs up for Pincus. Not, oh, be- yes. not because of what he achieved, but because at the end of the day, it's time for for the technology community like to engage, empower, connect, you know, and, and you know, I, I'm I'm on signed up on a whole bunch of apps and, you know, some of them are better than others, but they're all trying to find ways to talk to me on my phone. They're texting me. They're sending, you know, I mean, but, but, but I'm, I am not moved by direct mail. Look, let let me make sure I'm clear that I agree with you in the sense that um, it's just like anything else in startups, you know, you kind of have to fail your way to success. And I just hope that these are not little uh, ego trophy actions where if they get shut down going one way, they just drop it and move on to something else. Because this is something we need and we need desperately. And, um, you know, it's not about one side versus the other. It's about finding elegant and useful ways for people to become engaged and become part of the process, not feeling like they're uninvolved. So I'll only say this, you know, I, you know, I've raised a bunch of money for Progress News Network. And in doing that, the one thing that I've encountered, and this is with all due respect to all of our mutual friends, 
like some of the questions that I'm asked by people who are thinking about writing checks, I would just describe as too smart. Right. Like I had one, I had one very well-known Valley investor say to me, you know, can you track your media impressions all the way to the voting booth and guarantee me that we can measure votes? And, and the answer is, of course not. Like, you right. know, like, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's a little like saying, what's the difference between advertising and couponing? Like, if I right. give you $10 off, I know when you go and redeem the coupon. But if I put an ad out there that says, hey, Gene, there's this great new pair of jeans and you might, or, you know, whatever, and you might want to try them on. Like, I, I can I can roughly guess if I get you into the store but there's no data around that. And I assume that when they're asking those kinds of things, they're being absolutist about it. Because of course we would like that. And of course, um, anything that can be done reasonably to, to, to go in that direction is worth looking at. And, and, and you will be judged by that. But, but, but don't be unrealistic, right? No. It's like, that's the point. I, I, just, I just look at, at someone like Sheldon Adelson, who's I think put $50 million into this election you know, and you know he's not tracking or he's going a million here, a million here, a million here, a million here. Because you know what? Who the hell knows what's going to work? And I'm just going to bet on a lot of things. I and, completely and, agree. And, I, you know, I guess at some level, I, I wish that the, that the Democrats, particularly the new digital Democrats, which is probably a good phrase, um, were being a little more experimental and a little less strategic. I totally agree. I Digital mean, I Democrats. In some, ways, in some ways, the Democrats... I'm registering that today, by the way. You know, by the way, you said new things versus old things. You know, there's um, a lot of the progressives that are challenging the center of the Democratic Party aren't necessarily doing it with progressive technologies or, you know, like, let's... We have to make sure that we understand, uh, you know these things are happening at multiple levels. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, it turns out that Trump's uh, grassrootsy, aggressive war room approach to 2016 um, uh, with the most reactionary politics imaginable turned out to be the savviest in the last election cycle. So so, uh, so, so let so let's get let's let's end on an upbeat note and let's definitely get to Uber. So so here's the thing I just want to say out loud. Whenever people say that they're bipartisan and they just want to get out the vote, let's let's within this podcast in the anti bullshit category say that we understand that get out the vote means left of center, that that the Republicans, for whatever reason, and we can talk about their dynamics in a minute, like they they want to suppress the vote. Right, with what, the exception with the exception that gets conflated here of rallying the base right like like it is true that that inspiring the turnout of the already registered mostly uh, over 50 you know white americans is their version of get out the vote but let's not confuse it with the idea of getting everyone who can vote to vote by getting them registered and everything right so 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 when uber comes out and says we're going to have the, on your phone, hey, are you voting today? Click here for a free ride to the polls. Like that's, that's a, they're committing a big number, right? The drivers aren't donating their time. The drivers are getting paid. Now, the, I don't exactly understand because I read it twice. It seems like there's a bunch of groups that are gathering to raise money to help pay for those drivers. Is, I don't know, but there, there is not enough details. And I have to say, I applaud it. But I'm a little skeptical because if you look at the demographics of um, of Uber, um, you know, uh, are the cars and the ability to bring people around going to drive this or, you know, do you have to be using the app and register and have an iPhone and everything else? Right. Because like unless they're parking cars with lots of space in the middle of places and saying, you know, there's going to be a car here every 30 minutes, anybody in the neighborhood just come on. You know, then I'm skeptical of it. So, and, so and they it, can only do what they can do. So, so you click the app; it takes you to the polling place. You vote. You come out. Does it give you a ride home, or are you pretty much stuck there? That's a good. <laughs> there's a lot of details there that I'd like yeah. to hear about. But it's a good thing, though. It's, it's a not, it's a good thing. It's yeah, and we need, we need. you know one of the things that I will say to all of our listeners and all of our mutual friends is, you know, if you're 
practicing this phrase, well, I'm not going to vote because, and then dot, 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 it's not going to matter, or I'm, you know, my district, whatever. Like, 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 you should email either Gene or I and have that conversation one-on-one. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like, the, the, I would like to see the, the, the vote totals, be they Democrat, Republican, Independent, Bernie supporters, Hillary, whatever. I would like to see them be massive. Yep. yep. And, no, and, and it's it's true. And, 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 you know, I hate to say that that general principles of what would be positive civic involvement and engagement <laughs> tend to be thought of too much now as, as progressive or liberal policies when it's just not like that at all. The only response the conservatives have been able to give to massive voter registration is the canard of voter fraud. Right. And, and, and it's just it's so sad that it's that cynical. So, so I'm going to end right there because Gene's used the ten penny word of the day, canard. <laughs> canard is a good word. No canards for us. Thank you very much. No Have canard. a good week, future forward, and we will be back next week with our pre-election show. And uh, that's right. Very exciting. So we'll see you next week. <laughs>